<laughs> hello. Good, good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, uh, let us first of all finish our first presentation, which uh, we haven't yet done. And here I would like uh, to touch upon uh, the, the topics of the role of exports from US and Canada, um, Northern America. We mentioned it in, in already. Both countries have turned over the past 20 years into not only oil and gas producers, but oil and gas exporters. Uh, just a slight remark, a historical remark on that, in case you had a chance to watch the one or the other video of the BBC documentary, The Price, um, which is based on the book by Daniel Jürgen and which is really nicely done, this documentary. In the, in the history of oil, the United States had been playing a major role in the 1920s and 30s. Um, countries like uh, states uh, of, 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 of the Federal Union like Texas, Pennsylvania, the oil rush in Alaska, California. Uh, so uh, uh, US was a traditional oil producer, a conventional oil producer. We were not yet speaking of uh, shale oil, shale gas. And uh, just a little remark also on that. The United States in World War II was a major provider of oil for its allies. And uh, I think it was like 15 or 18 years ago, if I recall somehow correctly, uh, the United Kingdom only paid back its debts, its oil bill from World War II. Because in 1945, when World War II ended, uh, the US had been providing like 90% of the oil consumption, whether it was military consumption or private consumption, by uh, the allies, uh, it as the United Kingdom and, 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 and all the others. So uh, today, North America is back as an oil exporter and which are its major destinations. Uh, and what are the perspectives for the major destinations for the next 20 years? We can see that uh, they would like to see Europe taking a major part, Europe is already importing, but they would like to see Europe import more uh, oil uh, from the United States and Canada. Uh, oil, one thing, shale gas, the whole debate on LNG, we will still discuss it at a later stage. But uh, the main uh, importer, as well of North American oil, not only of Middle Eastern oil, will be the Asia Pacific region, because there we have the uh, the, the major demand uh, situation. Please, Ekaterina, let's move to the next. Now, uh, going to China. Uh, China being this number one importer of oil. I mentioned it at the beginning and just to have it because it's a, it's a very telling figure. Until approximately 1993, 1994, uh, the People's Republic of China could um, do with its national production in order to meet all national demand, be it private, be it industrial. Uh, China produces about 3.5 to 4 million oil uh, barrel uh, of oil every day. But over the last 20 years, it had been turning into an importer. And it's today, and this today has been lasting for the last five, six years, number one importer. So uh, in, when we had the financial crisis of 2008, followed by the economic crisis of 2009, it was China that saved the commodity market because it was China's demand, in particular for oil, that kept the oil price on a certain stable level. Just to recall one of the graphs we had been watching last week, you might remember in 2008, the oil price climbing up in summer 2008 to more than 150 US dollar per barrel. And then September, October of that same year, the oil price crashing. Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy, followed by many other bankruptcies, uh, the governments intervening, nationalizing banks, whether it was in the US, whether it was in Europe. And if there had been the, this engine of the Chinese demand, special uh, stimulation programs, etc., uh, the world economy would not have 
been on the recovery the way it was and we would not have seen a relatively stable oil price after 2009 until 2014 then once again it went down uh, now china is as and i repeat myself is not only an investor like was japan in the 80s uh, japan invested it wasted but Ch japan in my eyes and i think this 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 I dare to say this is a general assessment. Japan did not invest with a political goal on its agenda. Uh, when Japan bought studios in Hollywood, uh, it was for business and no other reasons. Um, now, when China started to buy concessions on the African continent, uh, whether it was in West Africa, whether it was in Sudan, turning Sudan in 2005 into a net exporter that was before the partition of Sudan uh, and today it's the trade number uh, trade partner number one of main oil producers in in the Middle East with the pandemic uh, COVID-19 we saw that uh, the world economy was already shivering was shaken in January in February everybody was watching with concern what is going on in China because in contrast to the SARS crisis, the pandemic of 2003, when China was covering only like, I think four, five, 6% of world economy, China today covers nearly 20% of global economy. So whatever happens in China on an economic basis, be it uh, a recovery, be it uh, a decline, has a major impact on the rest of the world. Uh, nobody could foresee that by mid-March we would have something like a global lockdown and we have already discussed that and uh, we will discuss everybody will discuss it my guess is for the next five years because it has it, it has it will be a major shift of uh, world economy world politics what has been going on and what is still um, in force for many countries and what we have seen is we moved from Global mobility, permanent uh, supply, uh, global supply chains. We moved from that situation to a global immobility. Uh, and now China is the first major country to be back. Um, industrial production had been starting over the last few weeks, car production, um, even so there are news about uh, new infection cases in the city of Wuhan, where it apparently all started. But um, China is back and China will be the first one to be back. And China has here a certain advantage of, of picking up that many EU countries, that the US definitely and, and many others, uh, be it Japan, be it the Russian Federation, etc., don't have. Please, the next one. Um, you all have heard about the Silk Road. It has many names, the Silk Road Initiative. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the Chinese leadership changed uh, the term from uh, Silk Road Strategy or Belt and Road Strategy, as they also call it. The official name is BRI, which stands for Belt and Road Initiative. So from strategy, we move to initiative doesn't sound that, uh, how should I say, uh, that uh, frightening maybe, threatening for some, which are immediately affected, be it the Central Asians, uh, be it some of the South Asian countries. Uh, but this Seidenstraße Doctrine, as we also call it in German, or the Seidenstraße Initiative, I put it here again in German and in, 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 in English, uh, because I promised to use some terminology both in English, German, and where it suits also in French. So once again, uh, it's not just an economic program, but a geopolitical strategy. You, you have all seen that map most probably several times, the new Silk Road, and here we have uh, the, uh, the land route, following the ancient Marco Polo path and uh, the Maritime Silk Road, the so-called uh, String of Pearls um, road. <clears throat> what we don't see on this map is uh, the, China, the, the, the continuation of that initiative program when it comes to Latin America, because there, of course, 
we also see major Chinese uh, investments and major Chinese presence. Uh, just to mention one uh, country that, according to statistics, is number one in reserves. And uh, unfortunately, we are now not in, in a room where we can discuss face to face, but otherwise I would have asked a question. But um, maybe you remember from one of the graphic material, the number one country in reserves, not in daily production, in reserves is Venezuela. Now, Venezuela, as we know, is in, in a big, big quagmire, economic, social, political, etc. But one should not forget uh, the, the tremendous role China also plays there, also plays in Venezuela, I would say, not visibly, it's not, not very, very tangible, but it is there also in this standoff with the United States uh, uh, that we have in Venezuela. The next one, please. Uh, here you have a map that uh, it more or less picks up on, 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 the, on the previous map. But what I would like to show here, because uh, it, 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 it goes uh, in more into the motivation of uh, the Second Road or Belt and Road Initiative, um, the, the, the early days of that initiative, when President uh, Xi Jinping uh, started it in 2013, officially started it, because there have been investments in particular in Kazakhstan and other uh, Central Asian countries already beforehand, uh, the, uh, the initial name for the whole initiative was China's March to West, Go West. Uh, and um, it is, if you want to understand it on an academic level, uh, one of the factors that might have prompted the Chinese leadership to do that was a kind of counter strategy to rebalancing the Central Asian initiatives taken by both the Russian Federation, like the Eurasian Union that started in 2015 officially, and uh, the rebalancing Asia initiative that started under Obama, I think in 2009, 2010. But of course, uh, there was also a social background to the whole thing, namely the fact that uh, the main industrial parts where there had been tremendous investments, where employment had been created in China is the northeastern part. It's the region around and, 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 and the southeastern part. Um, so the region of, uh, my Chinese is inexistent. I don't want to pronounce names in the wrong way. Some of you most probably study Mandarin. So uh, you, you, you know how to pronounce them correctly, but just let me stop here. Southeastern China and, uh, and Eastern China by and large, these are the places where we had the huge investments where wealth had been created, while the Western parts of China were still neglected. And the Western parts of China are also for uh, ethnic reasons, uh, um, uh, let's call it a headache, a pain uh, for Chinese leadership. It had been like that for, for decades, but it, it became more and more important over the last years, it's the region where we have a Muslim majority. Um, the Uyghur peoples, several millions, I think 36 to 40 million people, and the whole strategy of, 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 of what is going on in, 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 in the Xinhua province and, and the the oppression, let's, I mean, it's, 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 it's a major oppression that is going on of uh, the Uyghurs with all what that entails. Um, but uh, to come back to the motivation of the Go West China, uh, Chinese foreign policy, uh, it was all about development. It was all about creating new markets and also bringing in energy into China this thirst, this demand for energy, be it oil, be it coal, be it gas, uh, that had been a major shaping figure, uh, factor also of uh, this very important international organization, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is actually all about security and energy. Uh, so there are 
to, to just just to put us into the, the 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 Chinese setup because when we speak today about geopolitics of oil, uh, we simply cannot leave out the factor of China. It's not anymore a topic dominated by uh, OECD demand. We have seen it, the OECD demand is going down. It's all about the Asia Pacific region, where the demand is coming from. And this demand is also linked to a stronger geopolitical role the Chinese wish to play. Please, the next one. Uh, the cooperation that we have seen between the Russian Federation and the People's Republic about, uh, of China is a lot about gas. Uh, December 2019, the power of Siberia uh, pipeline, gas line. I don't think that in English we have a special term for it. In French, interesting enough, you say for pipeline that transports oil, um, oleoduc and for a pipeline that trans transports gas, gasoduc. So the French are a bit more precise on that, uh, but neither in German nor in English, to my knowledge, we, we have a clear distinction in the terminology. But here we have this tremendous gas pipeline of 2,200 kilometers going uh, from Yakutia into northeastern China, and all based on contracts that had been concluded in particular in May 2014, but of course these contracts had already been worked on beforehand. Uh, just to, to let us, uh, to, to remind you of the fact, March 2014, uh, Crimea, referendum, uh, occupation, annexation, etc., whatever you call it, I don't want to go now here into the terminological or, or legal details, but you know the reaction that's then followed uh, by the European Union, sanctions of July 2014, now uh, which are still in force. Uh, the, the, the overall public reaction, political reaction, media reaction in the European Union then in spring 2014 to this very close cooperation between Moscow and Beijing was like, ah, now China, uh, Russia needs China which is a very wrong assessment by EU um, public reaction because these contracts had been uh, negotiated, had been formulated already much, much earlier. I mean, these things, you can't do them within a few weeks. So uh, there, there was a, I would say there was a major wrong assessment. It was clear for every oil and gas producer over the last 20 years that you have to create yourself a market, a buying relationship with Asian countries. And what was Japan beforehand then became China. The energy mix that we have in China is 55% coal, if not more. I think they had like more than 67% coal still in the last years. There was a tremendous effort to cut down on coal. Why? Smog, air pollution, it costs a percentage of gross domestic product and of course also China wishing to play uh, a, a, a nicer role, let's put it like that, as a multilateral actor in uh, Paris Convention, climate change, etc. Today's energy mix in China is about 10% gas, but of course they want to increase on that. And then we also have an increase uh, when it comes to renewables, starting from a very low base and a major role playing more and more, of course, is nuclear. Um, in 2011, uh, an oil pipeline started uh, from the Russian Federation to China, and that was all the time when Russia, in 2011, displaced Saudi Arabia as the top supplier of crude oil for China. So, uh, 2011, 2012, uh, high oil price was uh, well, fairly high. It was uh, in the 80s, 90s, 100s. And here, um, the daily oil production of Russia increased and uh, Russia became more and more important uh, as, uh, as an oil supplier, not only gas supplier. We speak here again of oil for China and thereby displacing Saudi Arabia. I think now Saudi Arabia is once again um, 
number one for, for China, but these things, they, they, they change and shift from month to month. Please, the next one. Central Asia, um, another very important uh, region that when we speak of oil and gas, we have to mention Central Asia. Why? Because the Caspian Basin, the Caspian Sea, or is it a lake? Uh, we can still discuss that. I mean, sea in, uh, in, uh, sea in, in terms of uh, high sea, top sea, it's not, but um, an, an old uh, topic for an old dispute uh, going on. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, where you find oil, gas is often the byproduct, but not exclusively. We also have regions, and this is the case for the Caspian, this is the case for a country like Turkmenistan. Uh, very important gas reserves, I think after Iran and Russia, number two or three, depends on again how you assess the gas reserves. Um, but um, what do you do with gas? For a long time there was the flaring, to flare gas, in German we call it abfackeln, it's a very, how should I say, uh, popular word, flare gas sounds much more technical, abfackeln, it's also when a gang is, is destroying a house, you would also call it upfucking. Uh, so when did gas, uh, natural gas, change from an unwanted byproduct into a commodity of its own? That was in the 1970s when we saw a rising demand and, and gas became more and more uh, from a local and regional to a globally traded good because of uh, of important technical advancements that happened later, uh, uh, late 80s, 1990s, uh, uh, liqui liquefaction and gasification of, of gas, liquefied natural gas, um, and technical development of the 1990s. But it started already in the 1970s that gas became more and more important, also for the simple reason against the backdrop of the oil price crisis of 73 and 79, many industries changed, shifted from oil to gas for reasons of, uh, of price. And then later on, you had more and more the reason also of pollution, gas being much less polluting than oil. But of course, gas is also uh, has sulfur, has all kinds of emissions as well. But on an overall level, the image of gas, the reputation that it gained, in particular in the 2000s, was being a commodity of cleaner, easier, more advanced, etc. But let us go back to oil because oil is, 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 is the topic of our class. The Caspian Sea was always oil rich. We have here uh, the oldest uh, industrial oil city, namely Baku, capital of Azerbaijan. Baku, modern oil industry, and that started in 1846. And there's also an interesting part, if you have time to watch this documentary I put on your uh, list, uh, you can see very nice old black and white photos. Uh, who was uh, the, the, the main business uh, uh, family community that, that made Baku, that turned pa Baku into, into this uh, role? That was the, the Nobel uh, family. It was the, 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 uh, this rich uh, industrial family, very, um, what do I say, that's um, because they, 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 they knew that this would, would could could have a meaning for the future. We are in the, in the second half of 19th century. Oil was then mostly used for lightning, petroleum, petroleum lamps. We were not yet in the time of mobility. When we speak of oil, we always have to bear in mind, oil is the name of the game when it comes to mobility. So uh, just to put that as a main message that you can take along from this course and session and i will repeat it several times i mentioned it in world war one world war one putting it in a nutshell it started on horseback it ended in a submarine war it ended in flight battles uh first time that armored um uh, cars were used and so on 
So mobility is the, is the main topic when you speak of the oil market. And the moment mobility changes, be it to immobility, as we have it right now, this very weird situation, there's no other word for it in my eyes, uh, or uh, in, a, in a more technical setting, um, moving out from combustion engines, oil-driven engines, to electric, hybrid, uh, hybrid is, is, is a mix of everything, or, or hydrogen, uh, driven cars, whatever you might use, or something completely new, we don't know yet, that might be used. But if oil becomes less important for mobility, because mobility changes, then the oil price, the oil market changes. The political situation of oil producers changes. So uh, all that has to be borne in mind. Now, uh, just on a side note, Every Nobel Prize that is awarded for literature, for peace, for whatever, is based on oil. So if there hadn't been this enormous wealth that the Nobels uh, achieved with oil, there wouldn't be the, the nice uh, awards, because I think it's a million euro or dollar that you're awarded uh, when you get the Nobel uh, Prize for literature, for instance. We, we just had an Austrian uh, also uh, being awarded the Literature Nobel Prize, uh, Mr. Uh, his name, now I, I don't have it on my mind, uh, but it will come back, Handke, Peter Handke. Uh, so one million euros awarded based on the oil production of Baku, to put it in a nutshell, just as a, as a side note. Um, yeah, the Caspian Sea, uh, Going from Russia to Iran, or as it was called until 1936, Persia. In 1936, it was changing from Persia to Iran. The name, um, there, are, there are various, there are several treaties. Um, I can recall now at least two, but maybe there are more. Um, bilateral treaties between then Tsarist Russia and then uh, uh, Persian. Uh, Empire, uh, it was still the, uh, the Qajar family running uh, the Empire of Persia. Uh, we had contracts about who owns what in the Caspian Sea. Because the Caspian Sea, even so, is not linked to the outside, so it's not, it's a lake. It's in, in my eyes, I mean, not, not dwelling now into, into more. Uh, um, legal details, but since it is not connected, uh, like the Black Sea is connected via the Strait of, of Asmov, I think, to the, uh, to the Mediterranean, uh, we don't have here a connection to an open sea. Now, uh, this, the fact to treat it like a lake uh, has a different, um, has a different um, or should I say, uh, meaning for um, the, uh, the, the way how the neighbor, the, the, the countries, the riparian countries, those who, who are shore, who have a shore, treat it because uh, we had here a standoff for many years between Russia, uh, Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, etc., of who owns what, can you put a pipeline, a Trans-Caspian pipeline, for instance, from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan to transport, for instance, Turkmen gas to Europe? A uh, big issue. And uh, Turkmenistan over the years had been turning from being a major supplier for Russia and Iran into a major supplier for China. Now that Russia has the power of Siberia gas pipeline, Turkmenistan is maybe losing market share in China, but these countries all depend, of course, on the production, the gas production in the Caspian Sea. And all that gas and oil production, the Caspian Sea, of course, has had tremendous ecological uh, impact because what was the Caspian Sea famous for before all that fossil fuel business started? It was the caviar and uh, the fish, the fishing industry, the fishing, uh, 
or for individuals, all that has, of course, been affected and suffering. Um, Ekaterina, can we look at the next one and how many more do we have left? Well, this is another big topic. Um, let us move now into questions because I've been speaking already for more than 25 minutes and I'm looking forward to your questions and then we go back and, 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 and finish our, our, I don't know how, more, how many more we have left here. Uh, a few more, it's not too many. Please. Yeah, sorry, my eye. Yes, my name is Alexander. Yeah. yeah. So, first of all, thank you so much for the first part of your presentation. It was always very interesting to listen to you. Thank you. As, um, I wanted to ask you about the following thing. As during this part of the presentation, we touched upon the issue of China. And during the presentation, you said that we are almost certain that China is doing and suggesting all its initiatives with political initiatives and political things in mind. And I'm almost certain that it is true, and I absolutely agree with this point of view. Though I was wondering why we're so cautious about China's actions, why we're so certain that China is doing that because of political reasons. And it would be very nice to listen to your point of view on this particular issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if I got your question well, um, why are we always so... Um so cautious about cautious. yeah 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 you're fully right cautious is the right word all right very right word uh, to to illustrate uh this very uh correct term why are we so cautious um current example uh the eu ambassadors in china published an article i think it was in china daily 10 12 days ago and in that article it was a common statement by all the 27 EU ambassadors saying, speaking on the pandemic, and there was a phrase inside this article, uh, the virus that started in Hubei province, Wuhan, etc. Now the Chinese Ministry for Foreign Affairs took that phrase out and the EU acknowledged that and said, okay, we can't do a lot about it. Yeah, well, let's, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Again, if it had happened somewhere else, if that, whatever, I mean, it's easy to imagine, we, we, we all know what we are talking about, there would have been an outburst of uh, political, public opinion, reaction, etc. So you're fully right, why are we always so cautious? Um, let me answer it by the following. It is... I can't pin her video. Excuse me? Hello, Alexander? Um, no, it wasn't me. It was someone else, I guess. Ah, okay. Probably someone turned the microphone on. Okay. Uh, I try to... to, to it, 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 it's just a, it's a hypothetical answer. Yeah? I, I, again, for that, I don't have so much now evidence to say that's the way it is. But it is the tremendous importance that in particular, in particular, uh, the German uh, car industry, for instance, has on China. 60%, six, zero, 60 percent of German sale of cars is done in China. And this is the most important industry. Uh, it has been for a long time the U.S. dependence on China buying U.S. treasury bonds. Uh, now, um, uh, when we take President Donald Trump, um, uh, some say, I think this is a very nice abbreviation, uh, they say Trump got instincts but no strategy, <laughs> some say. And uh, when it comes to China, you will find in the US many voices also among democratic protagonists who say, well, on China he's right to speak up, to say, no, we, 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 we can't take that anymore. And, confronting China in a trade war, for instance. We, we have seen that over the last three years. And China will most probably become the topic, as mentioned last time, in the electoral campaign. Uh, so uh, uh, blaming uh, the candidate Biden as being a puppet of the Chinese, etc. This this is one topic. But we will see whether there will be a fully-fledged confrontation always on an economic level. I don't see it happen on a level beyond that. 
But here, you're fully right when you say, why are you also cautious uh, while uh, some open their mouths in a different way, which is not always the most pertinent and apt and helpful way. But uh, you're right to say, yes, we are cautious. And I've seen it the same way when I served uh, my short mandate as a minister. I think I mentioned it last time, somebody asked a question and I said, I was not in favor of a memorandum of understanding between Austria and China. We didn't do it. Like, unlike the Italians and many others, the Greek, the Hungarians, etc., because I didn't want to expose uh, our economy, etc., more than it is already the case. Uh, if I might have a question, uh, second. Um, yeah. Let's turn on the volume. As you may know, uh, Nord Stream 2 is almost in completion. They have uh, the boats coming with the laying the pipe work for the finishing. And I would like to ask, do you think this creates some impetus in the European Union nations to revisit Nabucco pipeline in a sense to rebalance the growing um, predominance of Russia again in the European market? Well, Nabucco is dead. Nabucco was a project that was um, mishandled, mismanaged from the very beginning. Nabucco has been dead for the last five years. Nabucco is gone. You won't find any investors. The whole Nabucco consortium has been abandoned. But what do you think are some European Union or individual nation strategies to, not saying too much Russian influence is bad, but to have a healthy balance between providers such we have, for example, Nigeria, in Algeria, mm. in the yeah. West, West Europe. Yeah, yeah but, but this, you see, I mean, for instance, Libya was such an idea to bring Libya in. I mean, Nigeria is much too far away and Libya, we're not speaking about gas. Libya, we're speaking about oil. Uh, Libya, Algeria, yes, they are gas providers for some European markets. Libya was, Libya could have been an important gas provider if there hadn't been the war of 2011 that is going on now for 10 years. Uh, we, are, we all agree, and I'm the first one to say, diversify, diversify. I do it on my tiny little level, and uh, in terms of energy, I do it. But, but Nabucco Consortium is gone. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Ekaterina, do you see anybody who has a question? I don't see her, anybody. Ekaterina? Hello? Sorry, if I if I run the presentation, I cannot see simultaneously the list ah, the, of because uh, I don't see here also anybody asking a question. It seems people. that it seems that uh, no immediate questions Question. right okay, now. Okay, because I don't see also anybody ask, raising. No, I'm I'm not. I'm just listening. I'm just uh, scrolling through the uh, people's mm -hmm. names. No, I don't see any. And he raised blue hand. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Then we go to, let, let's move briefly to Iran and finish on that. Sorry, I just need to find the right place. Uh, it seems that it we were here. Okay, okay. okay. Um, moving to the full screen. Thank you. Iran. Um, uh, a Lebanese professor of mine told me some 30 years ago. Iran will always act as an empire, regardless of whether it's run by a Shah, a military officer, or a clergy, Islamic Republic of Iran. And I think this is the key to understand Iran in its self-perception, how it sees itself, and Iran having huge untapped oil and gas reserves. Iran has most probably the hugest gas reserves on a global level, and it has huge oil reserves which are still not used, they are not tapped as they call it in English, uh, they are not yet operative, and they could be used. Now, um, I said beforehand, Persia changed its name into Iran in 1936. Um, there was a very close uh, relationship uh, between 
the then Shah Pahlavi, who was actually a military officer who had done a coup d'etat uh, against the constitutional uh, republic that we had very short-lived one after World War One, and um, Mohammed Pah Reza Pahlavi, the father of Mohammed Reza Pahlavi, who was then ousted in 1979, felt very close by national socialism. Uh, and uh, the Iranians, uh, seeing themselves as Aryans, Iran actually com comes from Aryan, uh, not wishing to be linked to the Semitic Arabs. Uh, they changed their name, the, country, uh, the, the state name, and Iran had been in use actually already several thousand years ago. Persia is a Greek name for the province around Shiraz, Pars. Uh, and you have in Iran, old state Iran, you have various ethnic groups. You have the Persians, you have uh, the you have Arabs, uh, you have Azeri. Many, I think, nearly thirty or forty percent. So we have different ethnic people in Iran, state Iran, and considering themselves as Iranian citizens, but being of different uh, ethnic. Uh, cultural background. Now, uh, until 1979, Iran, the Iran under Shah Reza Pahlavi, was the closest ally of the United States in the region. Uh, just to give you uh, 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 an anecdote how close it was and how maybe missing the, re the reality, uh, the US was uh, January 1st, 1979, so the year of the Islamic Revol uh, Revolution, had been preceded by months and years of strikes, upheavals, uh, huge mass arrests. Um, there, was a, there was a very uh, tense situation in Iran, and uh, Jimmy Carter, the then US president, traveled to Tehran to celebrate the 1st of January, 1979, with uh, Shah Reza Pahlavi. And in his speech, he said, January 1st, 1979, Iran is an island of calm in an ocean of turmoil. So unfortunately, nobody in the office of uh, the president had been reading the ambassador's reports saying, attention, attention, something will happen in Iran. They had just been disregarding that. They were not aware, I don't know for which exact reasons, maybe sometimes people, they, they are not aware of something because they don't want to be aware, they don't want to face reality, confront reality. Uh, but uh, you know what happened in January 79, the Shah was forced to leave the country with his family and uh, uh, a clergy called Ayatollah Khomeini who had been in exile in Paris, boarded an Air France flight and was flown into Tehran. Some compare that flight with the journey of, uh, of Lenin from Zurich in Switzerland to St. Petersburg in 1917, but uh, this is far-fetched maybe as an analogy. But what happened was that definitely the arrival of this 79, 80-year-old gentleman made a difference. Because what was beforehand a national Iranian revolution turned in February 20, 1979 into an Islamic revolution. And we had the creation of the Islamic Republic Iran, IRI, the, the official name until today. Um, Iran was still a partner of the U.S. until November 1979. What happened in November? Uh, the hostage taking at the U.S. Embassy. 444 days of hostage taking. That was then the watershed line. And some say that was the trauma, the traumatization. And ever since, until today, uh, more than four, four, 45 years later, we we see the situation that uh, the U.S. is not speaking to Iran or there's this, this very strong antagonization. Now, with the decline, with the, uh, with, with the non-existent role anymore of uh, Iran, who replaced Iran? The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
it was in the 80s that Saudi Arabia became more and more important. Saudi Arabia had already been, of course, an important partner. We had Saudi Aramco running the country more, um, Aramco before and running the country before it was turned into Saudi Aramco. U.S. presence in, in Saudi Arabia, tremendous importance. Uh, in, when, when, we, when we briefly browse the last decades, despite the sanction regimes, and we always had sanctions against Iran, but many companies said, well, let's defy the sanctions. Uh, we still want to do business in Iran and we will see whether the United States will punish us for that or not. For instance, the Italian oil and gas producer, Eni, very active, British Petroleum, Beyond Petroleum, very active until the very harsh time of the sanctions. As of 2012, uh, when Iran was sanctioned by the U.S. Security Council in various rounds and when Iran was forbidden even to transfer uh, money abroad, remember the, 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 the uh, taking away of the SWIFT uh, transaction system. Uh, so then Iran really went into the huge problem and all international oil companies withdrew. 2013, new uh, detente reconciliation efforts under the mediation of uh, Sultan Qaboos of Oman, who made it happen that uh, in Muscat, in Oman, U.S. negotiators would meet Iranian negotiators. Interestingly enough, that was still at a time when Ahmadinejad was president. We did not yet have Mr. Rouhani. He was elected in 2013, I think May, June 2013. But first talks started in November 2012 in Oman. These talks materialized, improved. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met his counterpart from Iran, Javad Zarif. The two gentlemen apparently had a very good understanding, which is always helpful. It doesn't replace uh, convergence of interest, but it's always helpful. And uh, in November 2013, we had the so-called Geneva Declaration or Geneva Agreement, uh, end of November 2013, which came as a kind of surprise for some even as a shock to the Israelis, to the Saudis and some others, that US and Iran would start direct negotiations on uh, the Iranian nuclear program, etc., etc. Now, in July 2015, the so-called JCPOA, very long uh, abbreviation, it stands for Joint Common Program on Action. And what is the action about? It's hundreds of pages on how to supervise the Iranian nuclear enrichment for civilian purposes. The International Atomic Energy Agency closely involved as a guardian should be monitoring what's going on through inspections and so on. Part of the idea of the JCPOA was also that once that is settled, Western companies, companies from all around the world, not only Western, but all those who were forced by the sanctions by the US, by the UN Security Council not to move in, would now move in, would now operate on the Iranian market uh, and Iran could open its business also to, 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 to go somewhere else, and Iran could export more. It, Iran could go in LNG for gas. Iran could untap um, its uh, huge oil reserves, etc. Because under the sanctions, Iran was allowed to export only 1 million barrels of oil a day, but Iran could export up to 8 million barrels a day, which of course also put some other producers uh, a little bit in shock because uh, that would have meant uh, uh, also a decline in the oil price. But again, 2015 was a different world than 2020 when it comes to the oil price. Uh, the whole program never materialized for many, many reasons. I don't want to go now here too much into detail. But uh, one thing is that, of course, with the U.S. withdrawal in May 20, uh, that was May 2018, two years ago, in May 2018, on the 9th of May, Donald Trump announced the U.S. would move out of this agreement and uh, nobody is supposed to make business in 
Iran. Now, this uh, put a shock on various uh, European countries because the European Union, uh, of course, wanted and still wants to comply. And many others who are involved, like the Russians, like the Chinese, um, they want to comply with the, with the agreement. And now we're uh, over the, already in 2018, many e European companies such as Eni, such as Peugeot, uh, lots of French companies who had been dreaming of moving into the Iranian market, uh, were put under pressure and said, well, we better withdraw. Who moved in? China moved in to a large extent. So here we are in the situation that Iran, the empire, the Islamic Republic, had been surviving somehow these sanctions. Now Iran has also another problem, which is the pandemic. And the oil price anyway is fairly low. So even if Iran were now a huge oil producer, it could not make so much income as it had initially sought in order to improve its, um, its economic situation. So let's move on. Turkmenistan, I briefly spoke about it, but when you're speaking of this Caspian Central Asian region and Iran being part of the Caspian, we also have to look into Turkmenistan. Uh, as I said, the power of Siberia is weakening its role as an exporter to China. 80% of Turkmen exports go into China. Uh, and uh, Iran being a founding member of, uh, of OPEC, as I mentioned beforehand, is important as a producer of of, of oil, but also in the long run, it will be much more important also as a producer of natural gas. And Iran and Turkmenistan, this is also important to mention, just to show you the many, many different dimensions, underlying features that we have of this, uh, of this topic, is also the very close relation that we have seen between Turkmenistan and Iran over the years. Just while I, I was teaching in Turkmenistan several times, and I was explained there that in 1991, with the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the Central Asian independent states, uh, actually Turkmenistan was taken by surprise. And in contrast to Uzbekistan and others, which very quickly settled on this idea or uh, felt, uh, felt uh, ready for being a national, a new nation state of its own, a sovereign state, Turkmenistan uh, it took a while. And if there hadn't been the help, economic help, uh, very basic help by Iran, I was explained then uh, Turkmenistan would have seen tremendous problems and the Turkmenistan hasn't forgotten that. So there's a, there's quite, a, I would say, a, a flow of, of uh, goods and, and, and goodwill on both sides, even so uh, the, the political system and so on are quite at odds. Um, but we sh also shouldn't forget also about the importance of the Turkmen ethnic uh, people in Iran. Uh, as I said, Iran is a, is a state of its own, second oldest state after China, uh, but um, not all are Persians. We have many, many others, and they all consider themselves as Iranians, and among them also the Turkmen. Uh, what has always been a problem for Turkmenistan is, of course, it's, a, it's the typical situation of a landlocked producer how to connect to the market outside. There was a time, and since uh, one colleague mentioned Nabucco beforehand, Nabucco was a gas consortium project uh, led by the Austrians in early 2000. It's 2002, I think it started. It was abandoned in 2015 because nothing moved on. Uh, and in that project, they also sought of bringing Turkmen gas via the Caspian, Trans-Caspian pipeline to Europe. It never worked. In the end, Turkmenistan became more and more uh, a partner of China. Uh, now, the low energy prices are a problem for everybody among the producers. 
Uh, and Turkmenistan also has uh, an internal dilemma, but it's very difficult to detect that one because Turkmenistan, to say the least, is, 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 is a very particular place of its own. Good, let us move on. Uh, this just uh, speaking of geopolitics, speaking of military confrontation, military presence, etc. Uh, let me draw your attention uh, to the uh, to the straits, to the uh, to the bottlenecks, as they also call it, of uh, oil vessel transport. Uh, starting in the west, we have the Panama Channel, that is um, uh, a very important pathway from the Atlantic to the Pacific region and uh, it has just been enlarged uh, because there's, there was, now we have immobility, but there was the potential and there will most probably be the potential in the future for more intense trade, Asian Pacific goods going through Panama into the US, North America respectively, then moving on to Europe. Suez Channel, Suez Canal, uh, constructed by the British and the French in second half of 19th century, uh, making good production, good import from the British colonies in Southern Asia, India, the pearl of the British Empire, to bring it from there through the Swiss Channel into the Mediterranean, into Europe, into the United Kingdom. Um, the Swiss Channel was a tremendous. Um, facilitator because you saved weeks and transport and people instead of going around the African continent. Uh, a strait that comes up again and again uh, when we speak of geopolitics is the Strait of Hormuz. We have seen it on the map uh, uh, last week. Uh, the, uh, the waterway that separates the uh, Persian Gulf from the uh, Indian Pacific. Uh, will it be closed? Will it not be closed? So we have about uh, up to 18 million barrels going there through that close on a daily level under normal times. Uh, that it's, it's always a kind of white elephant in the room. What would happen if the Iranians closed the Strait of Hormuz? Uh, well, the Strait of Hormuz was closed on a weekly level in the 1980s when we had this horrible war between Iraq and Iran going on. Uh, it can happen, yes, but it, again, it's not the end of the world. Strait of Malacca, uh, very important strait also for many, many products that are shipped to China. And in that strait, like at the Bab al-Mandab, Somali coast, Horn of Africa, what's the problem that we face there? Piracy. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, there was a huge effort by various uh, countries, uh, be it NATO countries, be it the Chinese and others, to make sure that their vessels are not kidnapped, hijacked, uh, that, uh, that the people on these boats are not uh, killed, kidnapped, uh, at, off the Somali coast, off the Horn of Africa. Uh, because piracy is not a phenomenon of the past. It's not something that happened only in 17th century. It's among us and piracy is quite widely spread of the Horn of Africa and the Strait of Malacca. Please, let us move on. Now, uh, to finish on the whole thing, geopolitics of the oil market. What we see now, and this is again something that has been going on for quite some time, the return of geography and history. So just some questions that uh, we can now start discussing and that you might also use maybe for your essay at the end. How will the pandemic affect the race for physical access to oil reserves? Question mark. Are we drowning in oil in the long run? We are not running out of oil. Are we having too much oil? Question mark. What kind of new alliances, but also old confrontations might we see? Will the world become, against the backdrop of what is going on also on the oil market, more multilateral or more bilateral? Will we see more cooperation in the name of oil? These are just questions 
that I would like to, to, to draw your attention to. There are many, many more questions. I just put these on as a kind of, of, of starter. We can discuss now some of them right now for the next few minutes and then I will go back to OPEC or start with OPEC and uh, you can also use them for your paper. I think there's still one very last, last slide. Yeah, this is the end of the slides for the first two sessions, which we finish now in the third session today. One of my favorite quotes by Winston Churchill. In 1911, he already stated very truly, liberty lies in diversity and in diversity alone. Uh, whether it comes to energy, whether it comes to when you are uh, an entrepreneur, you are running a company, never ever depend on just one, two, three clients. We see that now the supply chain problem, all the bankruptcies that I see also in Austria, for instance, in the aviation business, being dependent on one producer, car industry, etc. So in the energy market, I would say it's even more, never ever depend just on one diversify. So please, your questions. Thank you, Ekaterina, for the slides. Hello, uh, if I might have the, the first question. Um, since you were referring to the Iranian question, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, of course, I, I think um, we're all aware of the 1953 Ajax operation uh, conducted by the British in coordination with the yeah, CIA. But uh, excuse me, excuse me. Can we please stick to the topic? No, no, it was just, yeah. just a, a small, uh, do you think it was counterproductive for America to ditch to overthrow the democratic government yeah, of course, but we, we, uh, uh, again uh, we, we because we have so many questions and um we okay. of course it was counterproductive let us stick to the topic please thank okay. you <laughs> please any other questions hello are there any other questions ekaterina because I can't see anybody questioning here. Hi, Professor. I would like to ask a question about um, the Iran nuclear deal and the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. uh, and exactly um, what was the reason why uh, Donald Trump exited the deal when it took so much energy to, uh, mm -hmm. to make the deal? Exactly. And it seems like um, most of the European partners and Russia, they, um, they didn't see it as such a bad deal. So why did yeah. Donald Trump see otherwise? Yeah. yeah. Thank you in advance. You're most welcome, Alexei. Uh, the JCPOA, as you fully, point, fully rightly pointed out, it was a very complex effort. Uh, when you look at the document, you can look it up on, on, on Google. It's, it's available um, as a PDF. It's hundreds of pages and the, the drafting committee was composed of uh, diplomats, lawyers, but also lots and lots of natural scientists because it's so complex uh, when you deal with all the enrichment details of plutonium, uranium, etc. And uh, there were well, the, a lot of people really put a uh, lot of sleepless nights into, into that document. And I always also prefer to call it an agreement and not just a deal. I know that deal is the, the way everybody likes to use, but, but it's a very complex agreement, a contract. Uh, and um, on that level, um, uh, it's a pity. First of all, let me put out, speaking in terms of international relations, and many of you studied that topic, um, you know the Latin term of pacta sunt servanda. Contracts have to be preserved. Now, moving out of that creates uncertainty, insecurity. I would go that far by claiming that we will not see a nuclear agreement negotiation process, not even in the beginning between North Korea and Security Council, US, whoever might be involved, because Pyongyang has been watching what, what happened to the JCPOA. So they will see, well, why should we 
invest our time in, in handling that, it can be dissolved anytime if somebody wants to move out. So speaking from a legal level, and you don't have to be a legal formalist, just somebody who uses common sense and who wants to get things done. Uh, it was a huge setback for international relations by and large, number one. Why did uh, President Trump do that? Uh, he made his campaign on we, I will get out of the JCPOA and so on, and it makes no sense, and uh, Iran is, is, is dangerous and so on. Uh, the, the motivation for that is, uh, and I, I may add as a footnote, I understand it to a certain point, but still it doesn't justify the withdrawal. Uh, what the negotiators of the JCPOA explicitly omitted left open was the regional role of Iran. Everybody concentrated, and that was maybe a good thing. They said, let's focus on the nuclear enrichment program. We only uh, handle that. Uh, but countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, the Emirates, and above all the United States were upset by the tremendous outreach that Iran had been uh, doing over the last decades in the region by and large. So Iran turning into a tremendous player in Iraq, Iran being a very important player in Syria, in Lebanon over the last decades. Now all that happened not because Iran has such an astute foreign policy, it happened because uh, the wars that the West, the Iran, the Iraq war of 2003, the war in Syria, etc. It was that uh, those decision making that opened the gates for Iran to move in. And this was omitted. And here the US said, well, we have to rewrite the whole thing. And uh, according to Mr. Trump, you can do something like that on a one page or a three page maximum. No, you can't. It's much too complicated. But um, he would like to see something new. He had said in the past few months also, I, I would like to discuss with Iran and I want to call and meet Mr. Rouhani, etc. Rouhani said, no, I, I have not the slightest interest in meeting you. Uh, and uh, Khamenei, the actual decision maker, the actual uh, power center in Iran, he said over the last years, well, you see, I was right. I always say, don't trust the United States. So you have this tremendous internal a power keg that is also causing, of course, problems. Those who thought you can use diplomacy, you can use negotiations, such as Rouhani and Minister Sarif, were left in the rain. And those who were more conservative and said, don't talk to the United States, were proven right to a certain extent. Um, and um, now, uh, if you can rewrite it, I doubt it. My stance is, and this is still, I would say, the position of the European Union and all the others who have signed the JCPOA, namely China and the Russian Federation, they say we have to save that, that contract. Somehow we have to save it. But it's all a stalemate. Alexei, somehow answered? Um, yes, but... I guess I'm still curious why exactly Trump didn't like it. Maybe you did answer it, but I just wasn't. It was uh, the, the regional role, the regional role of, 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 um, of Iran, the uh, outreach of Iran in Syria, in Iraq. You know, the, the Americans sacrificed billions of money for Iraq and, and people and the destruction of the country. And who runs today Iraq? The Iranians. The Iranians, I see. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I have a question. You said that after the withdrawal of the United States from the, um, from the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, there were many implications for the European Union, Russia, and also China. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, it will have China I mean, um, an important role in trying to rebuild that agreement or or not? Yeah, I think this agreement can somehow be fenced, can somehow be saved. Maybe also if everybody now understands that 
we have to cooperate on several levels. I mean, the watershed line that we are living through right now with the COVID crisis, with the global economic decline, I do hope, I, I, I sincerely do hope that um, people will understand uh, we, we should not open another front. And the Iranian front was like uh, the number one headline. Uh, when we go back to the beginning of this year, 2020, it's only five months old this year. Uh, first, fourth, I think it was the 4th or 5th of January, there was the killing of the Iranian General Soleimani in Baghdad. Huge outbreak of headlines and fever and oh, what will happen next? Will we see a fully fledged war between the United States and Iran? That was like the debate for at least 48 hours on all TV stations. I was in one of those debates, I said, no, I don't see a fully fledged war. Nobody has an interest in that. Everybody has somehow the interest to make it work, you know? And uh, in the end, it's a lot about face saving. The, the, the US administration has been banning so much out, but in the end, Trump refrained from a major attack against Iran. He refrained. And uh, Trump, if, if Trump, I have no idea, but let's assume Donald Trump is having a second term. Let's assume that. We don't know what will happen until November. I would not exclude some sort of uh, arrangement with Iran. Thank you. You're welcome. So any further questions, please? Yeah, um, I might have one, if I might. Please. Yeah, please, Alexander. Uh, yeah, so again, thank you so much. Uh, I have the following question. I've seen it in many articles, for example, in The Economist, in The Foreign Affairs magazine, etc. There seems to be an issue about how we are going to be using the, uh, well, the traditional sources of energy, such as oil, gas, that we are discussing. Though many experts believe that we might probably divert to renewables, and it may be way more effective, and it may be way more realizable, if you can say so, than it was before because it is a good time for ec activists, it is a good time for green parties, and probably they will not allow many governments, for example, in the European Union, to get back to the, well, the so-called traditional resources, and they will be more about the renewables. Do you think that such countries as Saudi Arabia or Russia may suffer a lot from it in the long perspective if the whole world diverts to renewables, mm. never gets back to the oil again. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's the it's the question, you know, will the world go renewable because of in uh, because of the normative pressure that you have in terms of green deals arranged inside the European Union? When you take the very ambitious statement by Ursula von der Leyen uh, at the beginning of her uh, administration in December and also now in early March she spoke about Green Deal, Green Deal, it's the number one issue for the current uh, um, uh, Commission of the European Union uh, and it includes that in transport the European Union by the year 2015, so in another 30 years, 90% of transport should be non-fossil. So that means the end of the combustion engine, that would mean the end of all oil imports of a huge market. Uh, the Chinese know about the problems with fossil fuels, uh, so they are also thinking of, of moving out. The transition in the combustion engine, this is, this is the huge, huge challenge, in particular for car producers. It is a challenge for the oil producing countries because those which depend like 70, 80, 90 percent, countries like Saudi Arabia, most of the Gulf countries, with the exception of Iran, they depend a lot on oil revenues. So we already see now that uh, with this tremendous decline in the oil price, not because that we, we don't drive by oil anymore, but because we have the global lockdown, all what that means for those countries. And uh, how will now be the immediate decision making 
will we remain on on a clean energy policy let's call it like that uh, i've thought about it and my current uh, feeling is for the time being things might change in another year but currently i would answer with this tremendous economic problem that we have in each and every country uh, with people losing work becoming poor in the in the genuine sense of the word impoverishment i don't think that you have now a consumer group that is ready to board on the next technology uh, who will now be in a in a in a position to buy an electric car that costs more and also the electric car has its ecological question marks also will we have the investments to go now renewable on a large scheme it requires tremendous investments the german energy transition started nine years ago has a financial problem because you can also only do it with subsidies now the subsidies right now are needed to save the economy so very difficult time for political decision making whether we will really see this now as the opportunity to go renewable or this now as a as a as a break for for going renewable yeah thank you thank you so oh, much yeah. okay so any further questions yes hello i have another question um could you please elaborate on the role of uh, energy resource and pipeline geopolitics and the ongoing Syria conflict? The Syrian conflict, yeah. While there has been a lot of talk that one of the many reasons for the Syrian war in 2011 might have been a pipeline going from the uh, Gulf through Syria and that maybe I have no idea this I have read a lot about it that the Assad government rejected it and that's why I know that this is a topic it might have been uh, one of the many many factors but I don't see that it was the main factor for the war in Syria I think the war in Syria as far as I've been observing it was based on a wrong assessment by the government about the protests they didn't understand what the protests were about. Uh, overreaction by the government, but of course also a, a proxy war from day number one, namely Saudi, Emirati, Iranian, uh, French sponsored, all, you name it, you have it. You had such a huge group of sponsors of the war that in my eyes, I never called it civil war in Syria, I called it from day one proxy war because uh, you had about 30, 40,000, we don't know how many EU nationals going to Syria. Austrians, 600 Austrians going there. You had French, Germans, Belgium. Now, many of them with a migrant background, be it uh, North African, be it Bosnian, be it Chechen in Austrian case, but not exclusively. There were also Austrian Austrians going to Syria, destroying Syria, because they thought they could now create a new wonderful society or whatever, you know. Uh, so the war in Syria has many, many factors and reasons. This pipeline issue, I, I, I read about it, but I don't consider it as the number one reason. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, any further questions, please? It seems, it seems none for Thank the you. moment. Thank you, Ekaterina. Now, we've got a few, let's say 10 minutes left, and we move now to OPEC. <laughs> Please, if I can, yeah, I'm, the OPEC. I'm launching it. And we will continue next. Well, luckily, we still have some more classes and we have buffer time in between, so uh, we don't have to finish it all today. OPEC. OPEC, thank you very much, Ekaterina. OPEC was created in September 1960 and OPEC will turn 60 this year. Now, it's not the happiest time to turn 60 because at the age of 60, you would like to look back on a 
I don't know, prosperous time and say, well, the foreseeable time, I don't have to reinvent myself maybe. But OPEC is definitely in a situation where it will have somehow to reinvent itself. And uh, let me give also here one or two main messages uh, for you to take along to give thought about. OPEC is often underestimated and often overestimated. OPEC is considered as dead again. I mean, I've, I've read so many comments in March, April, like OPEC is gone, forget about OPEC. I, I saw in the OPEC library at least a dozen books printed in the 1980s, which all carried the title, the end of OPEC, the fall of an exclusive club, so OPEC is dead. OPEC is still along, around, and I think that OPEC will still be with us for a foreseeable time. But of course, once again, it's in a quagmire. Not for the first time, not for the last time. That's life. And it all started in 1960, when the world was, of course, common, uh, a different place, in particular the oil market. Who was running the oil market in the 1960s? It was not the Saudi Aramco, it was not the Iraqi National Oil Company, it was not the Libyan National Oil Company. These oil companies didn't exist. Who was running the oil market? The so-called Seven Sisters, private oil companies, mostly from the Anglo-Saxon world, Exxon, Mobile, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, they were the big shots. Total was the only non-Anglo-Saxon, uh, but all the others, American, British, running the oil business. Again, if you have a time to watch this BBC documentary, um, very nice interviews with the oil barons of the 1960s. Really interesting to see their mindset. It was a kind of colonial mindset, to say the least. And in that, uh, to, to make you understand the the old east-west north-south conflict that we can very well feel whenever it comes to OPEC and the rest of the world. Please let us start here. This is a very nice old photo. You see here five gentlemen um, standing in Baghdad in September 1960 and starting an uh, organization, nobody gave a lot of interest in those days, called OPEC. OPEC stands for Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Important countries, not states. It's OPEC, not OPEC. Why do I mention that? Uh, because not all the founding members were states. Kuwait, one of the founding members, was still a British colony. Kuwait became independent only in 1970. So you had Iran, you have here the gentlemen of Iraq standing up, you had Saudi Arabia, and very important, you had Venezuela. So it was never an Arab club, it was never a Muslim club, as it's sometimes called. It was a club of the South. Uh, there was a very um, active, brilliant, um, um, energy minister, I think he was in, in Venezuela. I'm thinking of his name, sorry. I, I don't have it now in, in my mind. His counterpart in Saudi Arabia was Mr. Tak, uh, Takriti. Uh, and uh, they, they were talking and talking and said, we have to run our oil business, or at least if we cannot shape it, we have to play a more important role in being consulted, at least by the foreign oil companies, because they open, they close, we get more income, we get less income. We are not at all involved. We want to be a forum of dialogue. We want to be involved because the international oil companies, they still controlled everything. Uh, many newspapers and, and analysts like to speak of OPEC as a cartel. OPEC, in my eyes, is not a cartel. The Seven Sisters had a cartel because they controlled 100% from upstream production to downstream. Uh, OPEC today uh, covers like 35% of production. Now, what happened in the late 1960s, the first nationalization started. 
actually, we already had one nationalization that had happened in the 1950s, in 1952, in Iran. Iran, under Mossadegh, uh, the elected prime minister, and Varitim, I think, the, the colleague from Lisboa, he mentioned it before, and the Operation Ajax, Mossadegh, uh, nationalist Iranian government said, we want to run our own business. We nationalize the US oil companies and, and the British oil companies and all those who were there inside Iran. And we run it ourselves and the Iranian national oil company was created. Actually it was Iran the first country, big oil producing country that nationalized in the, in the Gulf. Now taking out uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, of course we had a nationalized oil and gas uh, industry beforehand, but now speaking about the Middle East and North Africa. And here, um, it was a kind of, let's say, anti-North, anti-colonial effort. The 1960s, it was a time of decolonization. Countries becoming independent as of the mid 1950s. The map changed, it was North-South conflict. Uh, and in 1973 and 1980s, you remember the, the, the oil prices. So then oil, OPEC became more and more important, but OPEC was all often, in my eyes, very often misassessed, misunderstood. Let us move to the next, please. Uh, the, the efforts to create OPEC, to, to go here a little bit more in detail, uh, who was the strong man in the South in those days? It was NASA. Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, uh, running Egypt from 1952 to 1970 for nearly 20 years. Gamal Abdel Nasser, together with Tito, together with Nehru, creating the uh, non-aligned movement. Uh, Nasser was the, the voice of the South appearing on radio all the time. And he was uh, a politician who considered his role not only as an Arab, as in opposing Israel, first and foremost, but also as an African statesman. Nasser put a lot on his role in Africa. And uh, uh, the Arab League, which had been established, the Arab League wishing to foster Arab pan-Arabism and so on, had its headquarter in Cairo. And actually Nasser's idea was to create OPEC as a kind of subsection of the Arab League. And there came in the Iraqis, who were anyway uh, unhappy with this tremendous role that Nasser played, interfering each and everywhere, be it Yemen, be it uh, in Iraq. Uh, they, over, they often saw Nasser's hand and everything. Uh, and the Venezuelans. The Venezuelans said, no, 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 L listen, this is not going to become an Arab organization. This will have nothing to do with the Arab League. This will be an organization by oil producers. And you, Egypt, you are not an oil producer. Uh, today, Egypt is also a, let's say, relatively important gas producer, offshore gas, but definitely it's not an oil producer on the level comparable to Venezuela, comparable to, to Saudi Arabia, Iraq, etc. So uh, we had, the, ah, here's the name, Perez Alfonso. The Venezuelan politician uh, Perez Alfonso and Saudi Abdallah Tariki, these two made so, uh, OPEC happen. They said, we want to be involved when the oil companies again say we produce more or less. And uh, just to bear in mind, very important, with the exception of Iran, there were not yet national oil companies. They were, the oil market of all those countries was run by Western companies to a large extent. It all changed when we had the nationalization. The moment there was a national Saudi oil company, a national Iraqi oil company, then quotas could be decided and, uh, and, and, and put on quotas in the sense that, um, that each and every country was allocated, allotted, allocated, whatever you say, only an, a certain amount of oil that it can produce. Very important message I would like to give also here before we end, or maybe we can still put a, take a few questions. OPEC doesn't set a price. 
OPEC sets a quota of production. So when you're a member of OPEC, uh, you decide at the OPEC meetings and beforehand who is allowed to produce how much. If you are not agreeing, if you don't want to live with that, you quit OPEC. Qatar has quitted OPEC about a year ago. So let us see what is on the next slide and then maybe we can change. Yeah, mission methods. Uh, one word on that and we'll continue on Thursday more in detail. Uh, OPEC is all about coordination. It's all about stabilization. It's, it's a really dialogue and cooperation slogan. Um, and uh, it's not easy to make this certain, currently we have certain members, member countries inside OPEC, it's not easy to make these certain member countries go along. Uh, but still, they manage somehow. And now the new format, and I will finish here on that for today, the new format is the so-called OPEC Plus. We will still speak about that when you go through the slides, maybe to prepare for Thursday, you will see more on that information. But let us stop here and uh, please ask me this a few questions. And sorry if we take maybe a few more minutes, but as you like, we can also discuss the questions on Thursday, whatever Katharina decides. Hey, Katharina? Sorry, uh, forgot to turn on my mic. Uh, mm -hmm. Classes will, regular classes will start soon. I see a hand from Ilya Serov. Probably we will take his question and uh, one more if yeah. there are any. And we'll uh, stop at this uh, yeah. moment okay. if you don't mind. Ilya. No, 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 I don't mind. Yes, Dr. Kneis, thank you for the lecture. I have just one short question. Uh, why Vienna became the place where yeah. the headquarters of OPEC uh, is located? Yeah, I have one slide on that, but I can answer it right now. Uh, they wanted to have a, a, a city that is neutral, you know, that is not um, uh, within a country that is a major oil producer. NASA would have loved to have OPEC in Cairo, as I said, yeah? but everybody's, no, no, no. Sorry, we don't want to be in your shadow. There was a thought about uh, Beirut, but Beirut was already in a difficult political situation. Uh, and there was a thought about Geneva. And we had for a long time between Geneva and Vienna uh, a rivalry. Uh, but in the end, it was Vienna. Why? Uh, the then Minister of Foreign Affairs was Bruno Kreisky. And Bruno Kreisky was among the first, if not the first, to say, let us recognize OPEC as an international organization and offer it in Vienna all the, all the status of an international organization. And that was a surprise act because, you know, nobody cared about OPEC. OPEC what? You know, these uh, strange countries, they're somewhere in the Middle East. They met in Baghdad and one of them is not even yet a sovereign country. What the hell shall that achieve? Um, and, and Kreisky had quite a good instinct, you know. He had understood that this group, calling itself OPEC, will become an important international organization. And Kreisky wanted to bring international organizations to Vienna, UN organizations, later on OEC, many years later. But OPEC uh, was one of those, in the very early days, he said, we offer you all the immunities and privileges that an international organization gets. You get a CD blade, you get a diplomatic passport, and you name it, you have it. And uh, they loved it. And they said, great, let's move to Vienna. And since 1965, OPEC is stationed in Vienna. OK, thank you, Sean. We have, uh, yeah, we have one more question from Bruno. And we take this question and then uh, make a, uh, a pause. OK. Bruno, please. Uh, hello, Dr. Nice. So, uh, hello. my question is on uh, on the relationship between uh, OPEC and the Soviet Union, because Soviet mm -hmm. Union was also a huge producer. And what was like their interaction, their their relationship in terms yeah. of oil production? Well, uh, in those days, I would say the five founding members that you had in 1965, you could put them all more into the against the backdrop of the Cold War, pro-Western camp, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iran in particular, very much in the hands of, of the United States, Kuwait being a British colony. Uh, so in the, in the very beginning, this was very much, uh, I would say, 
uh, to my knowledge, but I have no, no clear uh, facts on that, it, there was no relation with, with the Soviet Union. Uh, thinking about the Soviet Union and, and starting to, 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 to observe more the market, more came in the 1980s with the tremendous decline of the oil price. So one started watching each other's markets, each other's developments. Uh, but uh, the real uh, contact and so on started when, uh, with the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, when OPEC com uh, conferences started to be attended by observers from non-OPEC countries, such as Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Norway, Russia, they were invited as observers. So it was only in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, that things changed. Okay, uh, please uh, join me in uh, expressing our huge thanks to Karen uh, for, as okay. usually, a tremendous uh, talk and discussion. And uh, that's not the end. Uh, we are going to meet uh, quite soon, according to our regular yep. uh, schedule. Thank you, Karin. You're most welcome. Thank you, Ekaterina. <laughs> thank you to all of your yeah, questions yeah. and your attention. And uh, thank you for helping me out on, on, the, on, on, uh, on moderating and hosting. And uh, we will continue Thursday with the topic of OPEC and then move on. And uh, many thanks for your interaction. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a nice uh, day. And we are looking forward to the next class. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, bye, -bye Katarina. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have one. Ha <laughs> ha.